This is a gap. We've all seen them and heard many trading opinions about them. Some think to get long the gap, others short. And every trader has these hunches. We've all heard the similar Jerome Powell tie mystery. As humans, we all have these biases wired into us. Patterns we think we see, these are all just made up theories based on nothing. But with data, we might actually be able to find some answers to these questions. So I got one of Tasty Life's top researchers to help me answer this question that has been all over social media. After an above average gap, what's more likely on the next day? A continuation of the move or a reversal? But we ran into so many questions during this research. How many gaps were there? How many gap ups were there? What is the average gap size? By the end of this video, we'll find the answers to all these questions. At first, I tried doing the research on my own, but I quickly realized I need someone with real experience in developing and crunching data to get the answers that I was looking for. So I went to our research team for some help. Number one thing is sample size, uh, causations, correlations, the readability of their data, and the readability of uh, their tables and diagrams, making sure people can understand it. Because remember, people can have different interpretations based on their own internal biases. Okay, so we got the basics, but there's so many ways to manipulate data. I wanted to make sure that the data we got was correct and answered the questions that I need to help my trading. So I'll ask you, Errol, central limit theorem. Have you ever heard of that? No. No. <laughs> no. Sample size of 30, nothing. <laughs> All right, so this is, I'm asking you these questions because this is exactly what we try to look for. So we try to have, uh, central limit theorem basically says that if you have at least 30 data points, then you can run a statistical study on it. The statistical study you can assume to be norm, uh, normally distributed and you can run your experiment, you can run your research study on it basically. So we try to hit that 30 number, but 30 is not enough. Basically it's saying the more you have, the better. We can go up to the thousands, two thousands, three thousands, whatever. Because, think about it logically, the more sample, the more items that you have in your experiment, basically, the more you're able to hit the different aspects of the sample that might be different. And even with all this, I wanted a simple walkthrough of how exactly I needed to run my study. So first, we need to make sure that we define our sample, what sample we're going to be using, and define the variables that we're going to be looking at. What market are we going to be looking at? Are we looking at SPX or NASDAQ or... QQQ or whatever, and then we're going to define how many variables and how many uh, samples, how, how many data points are we able to get out of that sample. And then we're going to make sure that we have a hypothesis because we always need to know what question we're going to be answering. And we also need to make sure once we get an answer, what the potential outcomes will be. This will help us go in the correct direction that we're trying to be go uh, that we're trying to go in. Then we need to make sure that we run the study correctly. They're not going to have any mistakes in the study. We're going to write the code properly and not going to have any mistakes in the code. And then we need to make sure that we can interpret the data correctly. So I took these steps from Sahil and formatted my study. We pulled the last 10 years of NASDAQ futures data and here's what we found. There were 2,666 gaps. Of those, there were 1,345 gap ups, 1,263 gap downs. Average gap ups per year were about 123. The average gap downs per year was about 115. Clearly, the direction of the gap doesn't matter a whole lot. When we broke down the numbers, here's what stood out. Out of 2,666 total gaps from 2015 through 2025, most of them were tiny. About 62% opens only gapped about tenth of a percent or less, and another 18% were between one and two tenths of a percent. That means almost 80% of the time, the gap is so small, it's basically noise. And that's why we bucketed the gaps by size first, to figure out what average even looks like. If you don't do that, you end up treating a 0.05% gap, the same as a 1% gap, and clearly they don't carry the same weight. Once we define those ranges, we could say with more confidence, okay, above 0.15% is where a move starts to get meaningful. From there, the distribution drops off quickly. Half percent gaps only show up about 5% of the time, and the true outliers, 1% or bigger, only happen 46 times in 10 years. That's fewer than five per year. And the true outliers, 1% or bigger, only happen 46 times in 10 years. That's fewer than five per year. So when you get one of those big gaps, it's rare, and it deserves special attention. Directionally, the split is pretty balanced, about 1,345 gap ups versus 1,263 gap downs. 
The market doesn't really prefer one side over the other. The only subtle thing is gap downs tend to be a little larger on average. But the real question was what happens after an above average gap? Something bigger than that 0.15% threshold that we set. And here's what we found. About 50.2% of the time, the gap continues in the same direction. But about 40% of the time, it reverses and fills back to the prior close. And only about 10% of the time do we just chop sideways. What that tells us is pretty straightforward. You can't just fade every gap because that's what gaps do. The base rate actually leans towards continuation, not by a huge margin, but enough for it to be your starting point. Fades are still common, not just the dominant outcome. And sideways is the least likely scenario. So the practical takeaway is this. When you see an above average gap, default to continuation until the market proves otherwise. Let the open confirm or kill that bias. Don't assume a gap will just fill because that's the natural move, but what do we actually do with this data? The best use isn't to blindly trade every gap the same way, it's to apply it as another layer on top of your existing rules and decision making. Think of it as a bias tool, not a trade signal. The data says above average gaps lean toward continuation, so that becomes your starting point. From there, you let the live price action confirm or cancel that bias. And remember, data isn't here to hand us certainty, it's here to spark creativity in how we approach the market. Some traders will find this continuation tale hugely valuable in building playbooks, while others, it may be more of a background context piece. That's okay, every data point has a different weight depending on your style. And the beauty of it is, we can always add more conditions. Maybe we filter out day of week, by volatility regime, or by whether the gap was up or down. The more context that we layer onto this foundation, the sharper the edge becomes. So don't think of this as a rule to follow. Think of it as a framework to build from. One more piece of objective evidence you can blend with your strategy to make smarter, faster, and more confident decisions. Let me know if you guys like this video and subscribe for more.